Welcome to the Hornets Hivecast, presented by Charlotte Eye, Ear, Nose, and Throat Associates, the official eye, ear, nose, and throat care provider of the Charlotte Hornets. Here's your host, Sam Farber. Let's welcome Mason Plumley back here to the Hornets Hivecast. Mason, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. You're having a career year when you look at the counting stats, points per game, rebounds per game, assists per game. They're all career best for you to this point. What's been the difference this season? Um... You know, this season I've definitely come in healthy um, and been able to stay healthy throughout. I think uh, also just the um, the the clarity on my role and uh, you know really leaning into what what the staff wants and expects um, from our position as a group, not just myself but me. I think obviously Nick is having a great year, and then and then Mark has proven himself in the league. But um, you know, I, I think we're we're really bought into what they're looking for, and and uh, I think that's why that's. That's some of the effect is the numbers you were talking about. For certain numbers, it's not just best for you. It's amongst the best in the history of the game, quite frankly. First half of the season, your first 41 games, uh, you were a player who exceeded 125 offensive rebounds, 250 defensive boards, and 150 assists. It's just the 31st time that's happened in NBA history, and you're one of only 15 players to do it, joining Hall of Famers like Charles Barkley, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, Kevin Garnett, Shaq, Carl Malone, as well as some current All-Stars like Damanis Sabonis and Anthony Davis. What does it mean to you to have that kind of statistical company and, and be in that class of player? Um you know, it, it it means a lot to hear those names. I think at this point, in my ten years in, uh, stats are are less meaningful. Um, look, it, it feels good to play well individually, but to me, if if that could be stamped with some wins or or turning the season around here at the midpoint, like that, it'd mean a lot more. Um, so it's you know it's it's good to hear that, um, but it, it'd be better to 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 really turn this thing around and, and find ourselves in a situation where we could play ourselves into the playoffs. That's more than fair and, and certainly the kind of mindset that I think fans w- want to hear. That said, not to belabor the yeah. statistics, you know, the one part of that particular accomplishment uh, that isn't reflected in your numbers is the shooting. And, mm-hmm. and you've had a career year, as I mentioned, scoring the basketball and Part of it is switching to shooting left-handed, which mm-hmm. has fascinated a lot of fans. Yeah. I don't know, though, that we really truly given it enough credit, because yeah. if you told me to all of a sudden just start writing left-handed, yeah. you couldn't pay me enough money to be able to get me to do it at a high level. Yeah. You're doing it in the NBA. Do you impress yourself that you've been able to switch hands at this point in your career? You know, but I think part of making the decision was just letting go of, of being impressed or the, the, the thought that comes with it. To me, it was more excusing the thought just not looking back and saying, once I'm doing it, I'm doing it. And, um, yeah, it's, it, it feels natural now. So that's, that's, uh, it's a good thing. When it was first brought up, did it sound ridiculous to you? Because like, it, it's not the first thing you would think of. Let's let's fix right, the right. shooting motion. Oh, let's just do it the opposite way you've done it your entire life. Yeah, no, it's, it, it definitely wasn't something, um, you know, it's funny is a uh, Jay Triano actually at a, at a certain point last year, he suggested, he was like, why don't you just shoot one handed and uh and which the kid in San Antonio is doing now which which I think is great um but then I had you know I had mentioned I had a, a pretty bad hand injury I was trying to play through and then that um New Orleans game uh before it I was just shooting with the left and I, I remember <laughs> Isaiah Thomas was like you should just do that and uh you know that and some some other thought and conversation went into it but that that night I shot with my left and um you know to me it was more like excusing kind of the um, all the all the attention behind it. it. You know, it was a softer ball, had more air, on, air under it, and it was it was straight every time. So to me, the result was something that I liked. What else can you do left-handed now that you've discovered? N- nothing. Nothing. It's funny. You said you tried to write left-handed. Like I was like, well, maybe I'll try. And nothing. <laughs> There's nothing else I'm doing left-handed. Are, are you even a little ambidextrous? Like, have you tried golfing? Or no, I know you no. can juggle. That t- requires both hands to have some skill yeah. there. Hey, you know, it's fine. I, everybody's like, oh, you should, you know, brush your teeth left-handed. <laughs> eat with it. I'm not doing any of that. So it, it will never happen. I I know that. Mm-hmm. But I just want to put this on on record. If you were ever to make one free throw left-handed, turn and look at Eric Collins, wink, 
and then make the next one right-handed, right. his head would explode. It would be the only thing he <laughs> talked about for the rest of the season. That's funny. Mason Plumley, our guest today here on the Hornets Hivecast. Last season when we had our, our podcast conversation, uh, we were talking about Duke and it was Coach K's last mm. season. Now your former teammate, John Shire, has yeah. taken over. Does it feel strange having a former college teammate being in charge of that program? It, it does. I was just talking to a really close friend last night. I was like, you, you know how you end up being closer with different teammates or you know, in different situations? John was one of my favorite teammates, even though we only played one year together at Duke. We always stayed in touch, and, and he's the guy that ends up being the, the next coach. It's, just, it's an awesome thing. It, it makes me feel closer to the program, and, and I tune in because of that. Um, he's going to do a great job. I just saw him have a good win against Pittsburgh, and uh, – you know, they they couldn't have picked a better. That's a heck of a job to step into. You know, I think a lot of people would would shy away from that, and um, I'm really glad that uh, he's he's the guy to to take it from here. Do you find yourself hearing more or less from John now that he's had the job, or from Coach K now that he doesn't? I, I would say l- less from John. He's got a full plate. <laughs> he's got a lot to. And uh, Coach is always ever since I've left Duke, he's always been consistent. It hasn't mattered if it was his next season last season retired he's always um reached out and and been a friend since so um coach is great you now have a new blue devil here in the franchise which i I have to add is owned by the most famous north carolina alum of all time and there's a lot of you know great rivalry stories uh, in the building from both perspectives but certainly maybe a little bit more of a a tar heels slant uh from the uh, upper ranks of the organization but all that said there is a new blue devil in town here with mark williams what is it like having another alumni and obviously a slightly different generation but you still have that connective tissue of both having played for coach k yeah you know it makes for some fun conversation but to me what's what's more is he's a really talented young big and i I think he has a chance to be really really good and um you know i'm hopeful to be a small part of that um, because I I benefit I had really good older guys in the locker room when I came in the league and I think that can that can uh, help you out early and they were not just talented and and great mentors I'm sure but some of the best in the game you had Mm -hmm. Kevin Garnett in your locker room Mm -hmm. when you were a rookie Jason Collins Brooke Lopez Mm -hmm. several other players who weren't centers but had 10 plus years in the game what example did they set for you that helped lead you into being the kind of mentor you are today yeah I, a lot of it was just observing things like work habits preparation um you know kind of how how they lived the the pro lifestyle but but what was also super valuable was just um like like kevin garnett we, we would talk through the matchup every night like how are you thinking about guarding this guy back then they you know teams posted up a little more so we would talk about you know, what's Pekovic going to do? What's Chris Bosh going to do when you close out to him? Like those kind of things. And and being able to hear how he thought the game um, was like so helpful. And and not just him, but like you said, there were a lot of guys on that team where they just loved basketball. They loved to talk about it. And, um, and they would tell me when I was thinking about it wrong, right? So like those were, um, those were things that, that I'll always remember and, and appreciate and, and I'm hoping to to share that with with Nick and Mark. The center room has been a, a real strength of the team. You having a lot of success, Nick Richards having a lot of success in year three. Mark Williams having quite a bit of success now as a rookie. How much pride do you take having had not just a successful season to this point for yourself yeah. statistically, but in terms of mentoring two young players who previously really hadn't done much in the league? Yeah, um, I wouldn't say I take pride in it per se, but I I just think it's like you said, it's been a strong point, but now I'm looking at it the second half. How can we take it to another level from our position? What more can we give? Um, what, what does that look like as a as a group? And, um, you know, I think it's it's pretty clear two of us are going to play every night and, and keeping whoever that third guy is engaged and, and right along with us because it's a long season and you never know what's going to happen. But, um, you know, like you said, I think it's it's clear to the league. Both those guys are NBA players. They can contribute whether they're they're starting, coming off the bench, and um, you know, now let's let's get the most out of that group here in the second half. It's a two way relationship. How has having had two hungry young bigs, very talented players, mm-hmm. pushing you in practice through training camp, tr- through training camp, yeah. how has that helped make you better? 
It's helped a lot. Um, you know, I think part of the dynamic early last year uh, was not, you know, I played through some things, uh, you know, injuries, I'll say that I probably never would have otherwise, but you look and it's, you kind of feel the need or the obligation to be on the court. But, um, and look, I'm a competitor. I, I always want to be out there, but it, it gives you great confidence to, to go a little harder or sprint a little more knowing that you have a, a really good player coming off the bench. And um, that's something that's helped me from a starting perspective this year. Last year when we had this conversation, you talked about the impact that you felt Isaiah Thomas had on the team playing as a veteran, mm-hmm. what he brought to the locker room. How do you feel maybe you bring some more of that this season, having been with IT and and, yeah. and how it has impacted your relationship with other positions? Because it's not just mentoring right. the other centers. You are the pick and roll partner to LaMelo Ball. You're involved in almost every action with him. For sure. It, you know, I talk to LaMelo or other, you know, Terry, like I, I've been fortunate. I've played with Darren Williams, Damian Lillard. I've played with, you know, Nikola Jokic, some of these guys that were like, to me, true superstars, you know, true, like best players on their team, on, on teams that have won in the playoffs and done things. So, you know, I, I try not to say too much, but if there's a moment or if the door's open to say something, you know, I, I'm always happy to say like, you know, this is how, so-and-so would approach it or this is how he thought about it and at the same time respecting like each guy wants to find their own way they want to put their own mark and their own twist on on their on their game so um you know I I always say I always have something to reference or point to you know I I hold back so that it's not always the the teammate talking about their scrapbook but um you know there is some experience that I can pull from and share Mason Plumley, our guest today here on the Hornets Hivecast. Mason, it's a very different stretch run the Hornets are looking at now in terms of where you're starting it position wise mm-hmm. compared to a season ago. That doesn't mean it, it has to be any different in terms of what your expectations are, as you mentioned earlier, wanting right. to make a push and make a run to the playoffs. As you see this team and how it's coming together here towards the back half of the season, what are your expectations for the club? You know, I. I, I have expectation for us to to give ourselves a chance every night. We're we're gonna win more games than we did in the first half of the season. I think, you know, we, we have to go out and do it. But just by way of being healthy and having Lamelo, like not you know, obviously we saw the effects of not having Lamelo for the start of the season, and he's an incredibly talented player, and he just gives you a different pace, a different dynamic when he's out there. Um, but to me, you know, I think growth from the standpoint of, you know, we're more we're executing game plans. There's there's less mistakes. Like if we're saying a game, if we're missing ten rotations in December, you know, by February maybe that's three or two. Or you know, if we're if we're making, you know, eight nine dumb fouls, maybe it's three or four in a game. So like to me, that's that's the expectation, and I feel like we're going that way. Um, you know, Coach made a good point, I think, after this last road trip. It's like, especially those first, you look at, like, Milwaukee, Indiana, the first game at Toronto. Like, we, we played really well it, in different stretches, and we come out of that one and two, right? And then the last game is what it is. But we, we've we played better basketball. You know, the wins are, are going to come for us. Um, and all, all the while realizing, like, if, if playoffs is the goal, if the plan is the goal, there's not – they have to be wins. <laughs> it has to be, you know, improvement and learning while winning. So, um, you know, we understand that. We we feel that urgency and, um, you know, the, the time is now, so to speak. In the moment, you can't make the excuse of injuries. You have to go out there and try and win games with whoever you are. When you get to look back at a 10, 20, 40 game sample size, you can say, oh, yeah, we were missing three or four rotation players, right. and that did have an impact. Yeah. Now looking forward, the team's certainly not 100% yet, mm. but it does appear you're healthier yeah. than you were the first 10, the second 10 games of the season. Mm. Do you feel comfortable, confident that you have enough in terms of experience and, mm. and players available to make the kind of run you need to make? Yeah, we have enough. Um, Gordon, Gordon coming back will be a huge help, but, you know, it I spoke to the start of the season. It's funny, like, thinking back about it, it wasn't just Mello, right? Like, we missed Gordon for a significant time. We missed Terry here and there. Um, Cody just joined us. Like, Cody's a huge – he doesn't get spoken about enough, but, like, he he was so big for us in so many key situations last year where you could throw him in on the best player and he he cuts the water off. You know, like, he – 
he's um having him back is huge. So, uh, you know, we'd love to get Kelly back. We'll we'll see where that is, but um, we, we do have enough to your question, and um, I'm looking forward to to what we do in the second half of the year. Last one for you. You have been a part of playoff teams in the past. You've also been part of two-year runs where teams built towards playoff success. And, yeah. and it was pretty clear the first year, even though maybe the wins weren't there, the foundation was being set mm-hmm. for future success, not giving up at all on what's remaining in this season. But yeah. do you feel with this core that you've been a part of here for the Hornets, despite all the adversity, all the injuries, mm-hmm. that you're seeing that foundation being built so that whether it's this year or next year, or whenever you do get to yeah. the playoffs, you're not just present, you can have success there. For sure. I think, um, you know, there, it, it's hard to find stability in the NBA. That's been my NBA experience, not just for me personally, but when I look at teams and how they develop and evolve. And I think when you have, you know, obviously you have a guy like LaMelo and then you have the pieces around him, you know, then you can plug and play a piece here and there. But like if you have a core and a staff that you can keep together and, and kind of let the let it develop over a couple of seasons – I feel like it almost always works. It may not be like championship, but it, it you know, you'll be in the playoffs, you'll be winning in the playoffs and um, you know, that's my hope for this group. Mason, we always appreciate the time. Thanks so much for sitting down with us Great. here on the Hornets Hivecast. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you for listening to the Hornets Hivecast, brought to you by Senta, the official eye, ear, nose and throat care provider of the Charlotte Hornets. For more coverage, visit hornets.com.